The place where all scholarship starts is definitions. If we don't start with clear definitions of our basic concepts, then we can never be sure that others understand what we're saying, and worse yet, we can never be sure that we understand ourselves. So in our first lecture of the course, we'll begin by defining science and anthropology, the two most basic ideas in the course. This whole lecture will fall under the category of philosophy of science, a topic that far too many people, including scientists, neglect. Without a strong understanding of the philosophy of science, it is impossible to do science well. To start with, we need to understand what a formal definition is in the first place. A formal definition, the sort you'd find in a dictionary, does two things. First, it takes the thing you're trying to define and puts it in a larger category. So X is a kind of Y. Second, the definition differentiates that thing from other members of the same category. X is different from other kinds of Y because of Z. So I might define dog as the kind of four-legged animal that barks. It belongs to the larger category of four-legged animals, but it's the one that barks. It doesn't meow or moo. So to understand physical anthropology, we must first know what category it belongs to and how it differs from other members of that category. What I'll do then is start by trying to define very large categories of ideas then subdivide them into smaller and smaller and more specific ideas until eventually we work our way down to the category of physical anthropology. The largest category I'll start with is science. Now the textbook's definition is pretty good for most purposes. A body of knowledge gained through observation and experimentation. It also says that science is a method of gaining information to explain natural phenomena but that's less good because it confuses science with the scientific method. The thing you're doing is not the same as how you're doing it. And not all scientific disciplines are interested in natural phenomena. Anthropology, for example, is interested in human-made phenomena. My preferred definition of science is a bit more philosophical than the textbook, but it highlights several aspects of science that are very important for understanding physical anthropology. Science is a knowledge system that assumes an objective reality independent of any observer and investigates it via the scientific method. So the larger category that science belongs to is knowledge system, which is just a general term for any set of rules for determining whether a statement is true or false, or in some cases, something else. Other knowledge systems include mathematics, or religion, or tradition, or even intuition. Now, where science differs from other knowledge systems is the rest of the definition. Science assumes an objective reality independent of any observer. All knowledge systems make assumptions. In mathematics, those assumptions are called axioms. In religion, they're called articles of faith. Science makes the assumption that there is something to learn about. This means that in science you start by assuming that there's something out there, outside of yourself, and it is true or false whether you agree or not. Other knowledge systems are much more subjective. Whether an idea is true or not depends on who's asking. Well, if there is an objective reality, how do we learn about it? This is a second way that science differs. Science uses the scientific method to investigate reality. And that might seem a little obvious, um, but what's important is the method itself. You can assume an objective reality without being scientific about how you investigate it. There are plenty of definitions of the scientific method, which the textbook defines as an approach to research whereby a problem is identified, a hypothesis is stated, and that hypothesis is tested by collecting and analyzing data. I don't really like that one because I use the term hypothesis in a different manner than the textbook authors. More on that in a minute. I'd define the scientific method this way. The scientific method is a way of investigating the world by describing observations, then explaining those observations, 
testing those explanations with more observations and revising them to be more accurate. The observations made in this process are called data and the explanations are called theories. The scientific method is an ongoing process. Those last few steps of testing followed by revision, followed by testing, followed by revision, and so on, they form an endless loop with no exit point. At no point is an explanation considered proven in the absolute sense. All theories are open to change when new data is available, and science is never done. This, again, is very different from other knowledge systems like algebra, where once you complete the proof for a theorem, that theorem is true beyond any challenge for all time. Now, the most important step of the scientific method is that testing phase. And there are two terms that are really important to understanding that phase. These terms are hypothesis and theory. Unfortunately, they're usually confused and your textbook authors have chosen to approach the matter from a different philosophical school of thought than me. Their approach is more simplified, while the way I'm going to describe the scientific method is more accurate to the way scientists actually think when we're doing science. The textbook authors take the approach that most of us, myself included, were taught in grade school science class. A hypothesis is an educated guess or a provisional explanation. And a theory is a hypothesis that had been tested and supported by evidence. The idea is that hypotheses turn into theories. It's simple, direct, and easy to explain in a few pages at the beginning of a textbook. Unfortunately, it's also the exact opposite of how science actually progresses. To see why, we need to go back and look at the scientific method in a slightly different, more technical way. In the first step of the scientific method, the scientist observes the world and notices certain changes. These are variables, things that are able to vary. And when you observe variables changing, you see that they change with one another. So force equals mass times acceleration. Or as the temperature goes up, the height of mercury in a thermometer also goes up. These are associations. Associations among variables describe the observable world. So the first step in the scientific method is to describe associations among variables. And that is, you collect data. But why does force equal mass times acceleration? Descriptions of that sort are completely scientific, accurate, and valuable, but they're not intellectually satisfying. We can describe all day, but what we really want to do is explain. That's the second step of the scientific method and where a theory comes in. The textbook definition of a theory states that it is a broad statement of scientific relationships or underlying principles, which is true. But what the definition doesn't make explicit is that that statement is an explanation of the associations among variables. A theory, in my definition, explains observable associations, that is data, by proposing unobserved associations. That is, we try to explain what we do see by suggesting that there's more going on that we don't see, at least directly. Our senses only give us access to a small portion of that objective reality. Science is about learning what's going on in the part that we can't see directly. So we infer what we don't see by looking at the behaviors of what we do see. Why does the mercury in a thermometer go up as temperature goes up? Well, the mercury appears to us as a single homogeneous silver liquid. But in reality, it's made up of these tiny, tiny things that we can't see called molecules, and they're always vibrating. As they get hot, they vibrate faster, and they bump into one another and push one another apart. And the mercury now takes up more space than before, so it pushes up the glass tube. You can't see molecules or their vibrations, but you can see their effects on the mercury. Our knowledge of molecules does not come from our senses. It is constructed by the theory. 
So molecules are theoretical constructs, unobservable things that are proposed as ways of explaining observable data. Now in this course, the primary observed relationship will be that ancestors and descendants have different traits from one another. The theoretical constructs that explain that relationship will include things like evolution and natural selection. You observe the traits of the ancestors and descendants. You explain those traits with natural selection. But natural selection itself is an abstract concept that you cannot see or feel or weigh. So that's step two of the scientific method. Now we want to test whether that theory is correct to find a way to show that the theoretical constructs really do exist, even if we can't see them. But since they can't be measured directly, we can't just look for them. We need a hypothesis. In this approach, a hypothesis is an observable pattern that is a logical consequence of a theory. If the theory is true, then the hypothesized pattern will be observed. The if part is in the present tense because it describes how we believe the world to be. The then part is in the future tense because it describes how the variables will behave when we next gather data. So if molecules exist and vibrate, present tense, then as temperature drops, so will the mercury, future tense. If natural selection exists, present tense, then species will become more closely adapted to their environments over time, future tense. The important point here is that the then part of the hypothesis is actually observable. It predicts a pattern of variables that can be directly measured and seen. To put it another way, a hypothesis is a prediction of what you will find in the next round of data gathering. But that prediction is based on the theory. If the explanation you came up with in step two is true, then the pattern you predicted in step three appears. The hypothesis is the consequence of the theory, so you can't formulate the hypothesis until you formulate the theory. What comes first is the theory. The theory gives you the hypothesis. Step three of the scientific method is going out and looking for the hypothesized pattern. If you don't find it, the theory is false. That's why this stage is sometimes called falsification. It's easy to prove a theory false. You just fail to find the hypothesized patterns. On the other hand, if you do find the hypothesized pattern, the theory is not proven true. There could be many reasons for that pattern to, to appear. Uh, but at least the theory is more likely to be true than it was before. So you never prove a theory true, but you do fail to falsify. And the more you fail to falsify, the more confident you can be that your theory is probably correct. If the predicted pattern of data doesn't appear, step four becomes revising the theory to explain the new observations, then generating a new hypothesis and going back to step three. Most often, what scientists find with extremely complex theories like evolution is that the theory is true in some ways and false in others. Uh, suppose, for example, that evolution does occur, but not via natural selection. Several 19th century scholars held such views. When that happens, we don't throw out the whole theory and start from scratch. Instead, we revise the parts that need revision and keep the parts that are consistent with the data and we improve our explanations over time. Thus far, everything we've discussed describes all kinds of science. All sciences use the scientific method by definition, but they apply it in different ways to different parts of the world. Let's talk now about the different kinds of sciences as we work our way down toward physical anthropology. The one most people probably learned in grade school is the distinction between the physical sciences and the social sciences. This distinction is based on what parts of the world the science is interested in investigating. Physical sciences like chemistry, physics, and geology 
are interested in physical things and the processes that affect them. Social sciences are interested in human societies and relationships among individuals within them. Physical anthropology is a discipline that straddles the boundaries between physical and social sciences. We're interested in the interplay between the physical and the social. The most basic goal of physical anthropology is to understand who we are. And the most basic answer is that we are the combination of what we are, the physical, and what we do, the social. So physical anthropology is equally a physical science and a social science. Another distinction is that between the experimental and observational sciences. The physical social distinction was based on what the scientists were studying. This distinction is about how they conduct the study. An experimental or a laboratory science is one that gathers its information about the world by actually manipulating the world. A chemist, for example, pours red liquids into blue liquids and records what happens. A physicist will build a pendulum and measure how long it takes to swing. So you do experimental sciences by conducting experiments. But how would an experimental scientist study macroevolution, as we will in this class, or the life cycles of stars? We don't have millions of years to wait for experimental results, so experimental sciences can't address those sorts of questions. Instead, those domains of study are observational or historical sciences. Instead of manipulating the world to create conditions we want to study, an observational scientist finds situations and circumstances that already exist. Physical anthropology, and anthropology in general, is an observational science. We don't study human evolution by stranding strangers on a deserted island and coming back in five million years to see what happened. We go around and observe human fossils that already exist then we compare and contrast what we find and we try to draw some general conclusions. It's finally time to define anthropology. As I said before, anthropology is an observational science, one dedicated to observing human relationships and behaviors. The textbook defines it as the field of inquiry that studies human culture and evolutionary aspects of human biology. I define anthropology as the holistic scientific study of all aspects of the human condition. I think the terms holistic and scientific are extremely important in defining the discipline, but ultimately anthropology is the science that answers the question, who are we? Now, clearly with either definition, Anthropology has an awfully ambitious goal, and no anthropologist can hope to really be proficient in all aspects of the human condition. So American anthropology is divided into four sub-disciplines. Sociocultural, or just cultural, anthropology, linguistic anthropology, archaeology, and physical, or biological anthropology. Sociocultural anthropology is the conceptual and theoretical heart of anthropology. It studies society and culture mostly by direct observation of contemporary living societies. These are the folks who go out to live with the natives and learn their ways. So since they're directly observing the societies in action, sociocultural anthropologists have a central place in anthropology. Many behaviors and ideas that are not accessible to other anthropologists can be studied by sociocultural anthropologists. If anthropology is about observing humans, this is the most direct and obvious way to make those observations. Linguistic anthropology is simply the study of human language. Because language is intimately tied to culture, linguistics is closely tied to sociocultural anthropology and uses many of the same techniques. Archaeology is the study of the human past through material remains. Archaeology allows anthropologists to study cultures that are no longer around. Archaeology thus accesses a deeper time scale than sociocultural anthropology and can study much slower, longer term processes. In this way, it's similar to physical anthropology and the study of human evolution. 
The final subdiscipline of anthropology is the main topic of our course, so we'll spend more time on it. Physical anthropology is also called biological anthropology. It is the study of human biology within the framework of evolution, with an emphasis on the interaction between biology and culture. Like all the subdisciplines, physical anthropology seeks to understand who we are. It explores that question by looking at the interplay between what we are and what we do. In the broad sense, physical anthropology is about trying to understand the physical nature of the human creature, but also how we can, to a certain extent at least, transcend those physical characteristics. Humans, after all, have culture, which is something that most other animal species lack. Culture, as your textbook defines it, is the behavioral aspects of human adaptation. More formally, Culture is a set of learned behaviors transmitted from one generation to the next by non-biological means. These behaviors help us to survive in our physical and social environments. We can adapt to our environment by a fundamentally different mechanism than most other animal species. Their adaptation is through biology, that is natural selection. But we can also adapt our behavior through culture. What we do is not instinct driven and programmed into our DNA. We learn what to do and how to do it through culture. And this dependence on learning makes the human animal fairly unique in the natural world. And it has made us one of the most successful species in history. But even though humans can adapt to our environment through culture, we also evolve biologically. We couldn't have culture without the ability to learn and we couldn't learn without a large brain. Culture is only possible because of biological evolution. We'll spend a quarter of this course looking at how and why we've evolved biologically as we have. What physical anthropologists have come to realize is that we adapt biologically to our environment and part of that environment is created by our own cultural adaptations. The result is that culture influences biology, and biology influences culture. This is the concept of biocultural evolution, the mutual interactive evolution of human biology and culture. The concept that biology makes culture possible, and that developing culture further influences the direction of biological evolution. In other words, there's a circular relationship between culture and biology in defining the human species physical nature. Each is simultaneously the cause of and the effect of the other, so that any explanation that includes only one of the two is inherently incomplete. You must look at both to have a holistic understanding of what it means to be human. So, once you've had the revelation that culture and biology are mutually interdependent, what sorts of things do physical anthropologists actually do? What questions do they ask and how do they go about answering those questions? One thing that we'll study is primatology, the study of the biology and behavior of non-human primates. We are classified as primates and non-human primates are our closest living evolutionary relatives. Therefore, studying them may help us to learn about our own evolutionary history and biological nature. Our entire third unit will be devoted to the subfield of paleoanthropology, the study of earlier hominins, their chronology, physical structure, archaeological remains, habitats, and so on. Paleoanthropologists are interested in one of the most fundamental questions humans ask, where do we come from? They're interested in the largest questions of humanity's physical and biological context. For most of the last 150 years, they tried to answer these questions primarily by hunting down fossils of human ancestors and related species. In the last 35 years or so, they've also begun using high-tech laboratory methods to investigate human evolution through DNA and other molecular biology. Physical anthropologists are also interested in studying the human species as it exists today. Not where did we come from, but 
where are we now? Physical anthropologists measure variation in contemporary populations, variations such as linear dimensions like height or limb proportions, but also genetic variation and differences in biochemistry such as blood types. We'll spend the last portion of this uh, course looking at some of those issues. Of course, in an introductory course, there will be some specializations within physical anthropology that we just don't get to. For example, some physical anthropologists look back into the past, but not as far as paleoanthropologists do. These scientists are bioarchaeologists or paleopathologists. Bioarchaeologists use comparatively recent human remains to answer questions like, what did people eat a thousand years ago? Or did the ancient Egyptians intermarry with the ancient Nubians? Paleopathologists use human remains to answer questions about ancient disease. Finally, there's the applied dimension of physical anthropology. Applied science is science put to practical use. The most familiar applied branch of physical anthropology is probably forensic anthropology. Forensic anthropology is the use of physical anthropology to solve legal issues, usually crimes. The primary function of a forensic anthropologist is often to identify the victims of violent crimes and the causes of their deaths. The TV show Bones was based on the work of the real forensic anthropologist Kathy Reichs, though of course the real work of a forensic anthropologist is a lot more mundane and tedious, and it usually takes more than an hour to identify the victim and catch the killer. So this then is a good place to stop. We've defined both science and anthropology. We've talked about how our own subdiscipline of physical anthropology fits into each of those categories and how it differs from all the other members. In our next lecture, we'll shift focus from the philosophy of science to the history of science, specifically the history of evolutionary theory.